Hi everyone, welcome to this lesson where today we're talking about inverse variations. And it's a little different than our direct variations, y equals kx. We know those are for our straight lines, our linear equations, but inverse variations are a bit different. They're not in the form of y equals kx. They're actually in the form of y equals k over x or xy equals k. A little different. And we're going to see that that makes a totally different graph than our linear function. First thing we're going to take a look at are is are these, is it an inverse variation? Does it follow the form of xy equals k or is it a direct variation y equals kx? And so on this first screen, what I notice is that I have this first table where it's 1, 12, 2, 6, 3, 4, 4, 3. And if I look at this table and I multiply straight across, 1 times 12 is 12, 2 times 6 is 12, 3 times 4 is 12, 4 times 3 is 12. And every time I multiply x times y, I get the same answer, which means it is in the form of a, an inverse function. It's xy equals 12, x times y equals 12. Or I can write it as y equals 12 divided by x. Those two equations mean the same thing. They're just in a different form. When I go to try out the same thing for the next problem, 1 times 5 is 5, 2 times 10 is 20, and I see that I don't have that same nice pattern. And so what I'll notice here is that this one is not an inverse function variation. Rather, it's an inverse. It's not a direct. I just gave it away. It's not an inverse variation. It's a direct variation. Because if you look at those x values, what do you multiply 1 by to get 5? Or 2 by to get 10? Or 3 by to get 15? You multiply by 5. That's a direct variation. That's in the form of y equals kx. And that equation there would be y equals 5x. So now with that being said, it would be easy to take a look at the problems over here on the right and say, okay, well then y equals 6x. Is that an inverse variation? No, it's a direct variation. It's in the form of y equals kx. What other function do you see here on the screen that's also then a direct variation? It would have to be y equals negative 3x. It's in that same form of y equals kx, where the other two are definitely inverse variations. xy equals 18 is an inverse variation. I can also write it as y equals 18 over x. And then the last one, y equals 8 over x, definitely an inverse variation. That can also be written as xy equals 8. And so what we're learning is that in a table, if you multiply straight across your x and y values, you're going to get the same k value every time. And when that happens, that's an inverse variation, which then leads us to solving and writing inverse variation equations. So actually solving for a missing x value or a y value in a coordinate point, given that we're told that it varies inversely. So in order to do this, you can either use what's called the product rule, where we multiply x sub 1 times at y sub 1. So we take the ordered pair, we multiply x and y together, and that should be equal to another ordered pair, x sub, y, x sub 2, y sub 2. And if I multiply those together, I should get the same answer. Proportion rule is also another way to solve this, but I find the product rule to be a little easier. So that's what I'm going to guide us with through on these problems here today. All right. So this here says, this says, write an inverse variation equation that relates x and y and solve the equation. So in this problem here, I notice that it says, if y equals 10 when x equals 5, find y when x equals 2. Well, what I know that means is that this is my first ordered pair. y is 10 when x is 5. So if I know that the function formula is xy equals k, I'm sorry if I should not have said function, the inverse variation equation is xy equals k, then I would just plug those two numbers in and solve for k. So it says x is 5, okay, my y is 10, and I know that's what's going to be equal to k. What is 5 times 10? 5 times 10 is 50. So that means my function, the equation, is xy equals k. Let me go back there. That means my equation is y e xy equals 50. So then if I know that the first x and y value multiply together to get 50, then that means the same thing should happen for my second ordered pair. So it says find y when x equals 2. So I know that I'm plugging in a 2 for my x. I need to solve for y. And when I multiply those two numbers together, it should multiply together and get 50. If 2 times y equals 50, I divide both sides by 2. And that means that y equals 25. Okay, Same skill for 
the next one here. It says if y equals negative 16 when x equals 4, find x when y equals 32. So that means that this is my first ordered pair. I would say, okay, well, I know that x, y is supposed to equal to k. My x is 4. My y is negative 16. 4 times negative 16 is negative 64. So I know that means my equation is x, y equals negative 64. If I multiply my ordered pair values together, I should get negative 64. So now I take the second part of the problem. It says find x when y equals 32. So x times 32 would then be equal to negative 64. So divide both sides by 32. And we end up getting x equals negative 2. And that's how we solve for a missing ordered pair. The last part of inverse functions is being able to graph them. And so when we want to graph inverse uh, variation functions, graphing inverse variations rather, um, it doesn't matter what form we look at it in, y equals 4 over x or x, y equals 4. They mean the same thing. But what we want to make note of is, um, you know, what values could I plug in for x and y that actually work? I tend to like the equation that's in xy form better than the fraction form. So that's what I'm going to kind of gear to. And you would ask yourself, hey, what is an x and y value that I know would multiply to get 4? Well, the smart, smallest x value positive y's that I can think of is 1. 1 times 4 is 4. So in my first table, I would put x is 1, y is 4. The next ordered pair, if x is 2, y would be 2 because 2 times 2 is 4. And then my last ordered pair with nice numbers, nice integer values, would be 4, 1. And if I plot those three points, 1, 4, 2, 2, 4, 1, I'm going to notice that they look like these three points on my graph. And it's not a straight line. It's not a linear function. It's actually a curve. Now, it's not only that positive numbers multiply to get positive 4. You can also have negative numbers to get a positive 4. What if I took this first ordered pair of 1, 4, and I changed the 1 to a negative 1? Negative 1 times what would get me this positive 4? It would be a negative 4, right? A positive times a positive is a positive. A negative times a negative is also a positive. What about 2 and 2? If I make the first 2 a negative, negative 2 times what would give me positive 4? Another negative 2. I'm really just taking my first table and I'm changing the signs. And when we do that, we're going to see that there's actually a second part to this graph the first part was in the first quadrant. The second part is in the third quadrant. First quadrant is where all the positive values are. The third quadrant is where the negative values are. This is what graphing an inverse variation looks like. Pretty cool. So now we're going to do the same thing with two more problems. Okay, we have xy equals 6. So in xy equals 6, I could also write it as y equals 6 over x. It's the same idea. I would ask myself, can I think of two numbers that multiply to get 6? The first pair would be 1 and 6. The next pair would be 2 and 3. Then it would be 3 and 2. And then 6 times 1. If I plot those four points, I'm going to get a nice curve, kind of similar to the previous graph. Notice it's in quadrant 1 because my x and y values are both positive. And then the second table, the second part of this graph, is really the exact same table, but I just change my signs to the opposite. And since they were all positive, my second table would have all negative values. When it has all negative values, the entire second part of the graph will be in the third quadrant. Now, for this last one, this one's slightly different because it says y equals negative 12 over x, which really is xy equals negative 12. And we know that if we need two numbers to multiply to get a negative, that means one of the numbers would have to be positive, the other number would have to be negative. I also can't fit 1, 12 on my graph, so I decided on my table I was going to start with an x value of 2. And I'd ask myself, 2 times what gets me negative 12? Negative 6. So 2, negative 6. Then it would be 3, negative 4, 4, negative 3, and then 6, negative 2. All of these ordered pairs where the x's are positive and the y's are negative would be down here in quadrant 4. Ra rash, excuse me, inverse functions are always going to be in the opposite quadrants. They're not going to be directly next to each other. They're always going to be in the ones diagonal from each other. So then if I was to take this table and change all of my signs to the opposite sign, 
we're going to see negative 2, 6, negative 3, 4, negative 4, 3, negative 6, 2. All of those points would give me a curve up in quadrant 2. So if it's positive, if the k value is positive, they're in quadrant 1 and 3. If the k value is negative, we're going to notice that they're in quadrants 2 and 4. The last problem for this lesson is about an area problem, and it says here the area of a rectangle is 18 units squared. The relationship between the length and width varies inversely. Let x equal length and y equal width. Graph the variation. The area formula of a rectangle is length times width, and it's asking us to let x be length and y be width. So instead of saying length times width equals 18, we're going to say x times y equals 18. Or I can write it as y equals 18 over x. Now, we know that area is always positive and length and width always must be positive, which is why you can see the graph that I have here is totally ignoring any negative x or y values. We can only work in quadrant one because length and width can only be positive answers. The first possible length and width for this rectangle would be one and 18. Now I know I can't fit one and 18 on my graph, but that's okay. I put it in the table. The next two numbers that would multiply to get 18, again, using nice integer values, would be 2 and 9. Then the next ordered pair would be 3, 6. Then 6, 3. 9, 2. And then 18, 1. Now, you could always use decimal values. Like, let's say 4 times 4.5 also gets you 18. And then I could just use its converse, 4.5 and 4. It's going to be the same thing. We don't have to graph those decimals. The only ordered pairs I can seem to fit on my graph here are these four, so 2, 9, 3, 6, 6, 3, and 9, 2. And when I connect those four points, I get a curve that looks like this, and that would be the variation that ref reflects this relationship about the length and width varying inversely to make the area of 18 units. I hope this video was helpful. Thank you so much for watching.